Hello everybody, my name's Z, and this is my first ever hands-on preview. Today I'm going to be previewing Bandai Namco's upcoming Tales of Zisteria. A few days ago, both me and my friend Mega G-Wolf were invited to Bandai Namco's London HQ to take part in a hands-on preview of their newest RPG release, courtesy of Game Digital. We got a chance to meet other Tales of fans, chat to a Bandai Namco representative about the game, and enjoy about the first five or six hours of gameplay. Anyway, here's my first impression on the Tales of Zisteria, and I'll do my best to avoid spoilers. The story of Zisteria is basically very typically an RPG, insofar as there's a world that's periodically besieged by the forces of darkness. At times where the darkness becomes too powerful, a great hero known as the Shepherd will rise up and save mankind. No, not that Shepherd. Wielding the power of spirits known as the Seraphim, only for the Shepherd to vanish into legend quietly after their task was done, with the promise that a new Shepherd would rise if the darkness ever returned, much like Link from The Legend of Zelda. So when the darkness rears its ugly head once more, people are certain that a Shepherd will come to save them. 200 years pass and the tale of the shepherd fades into myth, people celebrating the stories with festivals, children's books, anime series, action figures, all that junk. So that when evil does show up once more, people are sceptical it's even darkness at all. Only a few seem to believe in the stories and realise the truth behind the terrible events plaguing the world. Like climate change, or Donald Trump, it's all evil I swear. Here enters Soray. An adventurous youth with unique friends and a belief in the stories he read as a child. A chance encounter throws him into the heart of political intrigue, wherein he decides to take up the mantle of Shepherd. Yes, it's a choice in this one. Promising to lead the world out of darkness and fulfil his lifelong dream of exploring every ruin and dungeon in the world in the process. Lovely. Despite how it sounds like a repeat of several RPG stories, while I can think of a dozen off the top of my head that sounds pretty much identical to this one, there are enough unique elements in the story to have me interested from early on, like the invisible to the human eye spirits, seraphs, the source of the shepherd's power and general well-being of the very land of Zisteria. Why are they no longer revered as they seem to have been 200 years ago according to the stories, and why are they so content to have faded into myth, not to mention the mysterious assassins in black? No outwardly apparent allegiance, much like the Asians in Final Fantasy XIV. Their endgame is not yet evident and their goals are constantly shifting. Are they an enemy or an ally? It's not quite clear at the moment, and I for one am really interested to see how their plot will play out. Like other Tales games, Zisteria doesn't focus on the random battles like you'd find in, say, the earlier Final Fantasies or Pokemon. Instead, the enemies are visible on the field, giving you an idea of what you'll be up against in battle small chickens or giant dragons, for example, and giving you more control over preemptive strikes or being caught from behind, basically allowing you to sneak up on an enemy and ensuring that you get the first hit in, or vice versa. The combat feels a lot more streamlined this time round, the jarring feeling of jumping from world or dungeon map into a battle arena virtually removed in this instalment, without removing isolated battles completely. You won't have extra enemies sneaking up on you and jumping you while your attention is divided, for example. This does have the downside, however, of no more swearing at the screen because you've gotten into your 30th fight in about 3 feet. Sad times. Zisteria also goes back to the free roaming combat system, which allows you to break from being locked into facing an enemy head on to run freely around the battlefield if you so wish, depending on your playstyle. Meaning that if an enemy is charging at you, you can just scoot out of the way, if you're quick enough. The attacks in this game are divided between standard hits with your weapon, piercing, blunt or area swings, and arts, powerful magical and elemental based skills, both mapped to two separate buttons and changing depending on what direction you tilted the movement stick in as you pressed. In earlier games, you had the ability to mix skills and certain arts that would flow into others, allowing for massive, several hundred hit combos that were ridiculous and uber powerful, but they were very much thrown at you, leaving you to flounder and try to work out what did what, meaning you ended up only really mastering the system quite late into the game. Zisteria staggers the way you receive skills, 
one at a time and normally with a small tutorial on them. Meaning, to begin with, you can only hit with normal attacks, easing you into ensuring that you're following what's going on from an early stage, allowing you to hit with the mega combos later on much earlier than you would have done if they just thrown them all at you. Which is rather nice of them, to be fair. But if, like me, you're used to the Tails combat system, and can pick this all up rather quickly and don't really need the tutorial or grace period, don't worry, the combat system has been sped up immensely. This allows you to dance around the battlefield and not feel the least bit put out by the staggered skill system because the fights will be over in a few seconds. Now, I have to mention my favourite change in the game so far. Super Say- I mean, I mean, I mean, Armitage. Armitage. Um, Armitage? Armitage. Armitage is a kind of limit break overdrive system. After building up your burst bar, you can fuse with other party members to become like an avatar of the element that that party member favoured. That's right. You too can become the Lord of Moist, or Master of Trapped Wind. My dreams have come true. This enables you to use super powerful attacks for a limited time, and from what we've seen, it isn't just limited to the main character. It seems to be there's someone else in the party that can use these magical abilities. But how? Ooh, more story intrigue there. The only other change of note that I've seen so far is the ability to level up your equipment, which has been missing from the other Tales games. Giving them extra stats like 10% poison resist, and the ability to fuse your equipment, meaning you could level them up, and then fuse them together with other max level ones for uberly powerful equipment laden with handy dandy skills. Not only that, but equipment with the same adjective, like iron or amber in the name, can give you a same bonus, making your character more powerful, and boosting their skills and stats. There are other things which affect this same bonus, but I haven't quite worked that one out. I was distracted by pizza. All in all, the gameplay feels smoother, faster and far more interactive than it has ever done before, but at the same time it's not too complicated for newcomers to the genre to pick up, something other Tales games suffered from. When it comes to the graphics of Zysteria, it's followed the trend of its predecessors. Where other games strive for realism and hyper-realistic graphics, Tales disregards such standards of beauty and stays with the style it has always known. Anime. Yes, it's a beautiful anime game. The cutscenes are animated in this style, the characters' profiles are too. Even the graphics of the world and the inhabitants therein stick to this aesthetic. It leaves you with the feeling that you're playing through an anime show, or your favourite series with the story and sounds to match. The game's soundtrack is full of grand scores, conjuring images of adventure and exploration. Except the main theme, which is perhaps the most badass theme I've heard since Final Fantasy X's Otherworld. Seriously, we were sat there watching the opening scene about to unfold, and me and Mega G Wolf were expecting an upbeat, swinging tune, and what we got was something you could almost headbang to. We were both pleasantly surprised. The music successfully adds to the immersive feeling that you're setting out on a long journey, and that these things that you're seeing on screen haven't been witnessed for hundreds of years, yet at the same time it makes you feel quite nostalgic. It's always nice when a game you haven't played before makes you feel like you're returning home to some favourite childhood memory, and Zysteria does that in spades. On the whole, Zysteria only seems to bring very few new things to the table. None of its additions or storyline are very innovative. Many have been done before, and are replicated here with little or no changes to them at all. It has taken the formula for JRPGs and clung to it like a barnacle to a ship or a three-year-old to its parent's leg. Yet. It is because it does this that Zysteria works as well as it does. There are so many other companies that are striving for new features to add to their games, sometimes uprooting the very foundation of a long-running and beloved series and hacking at it like a trainee barber with a chainsaw. Zysteria delivers the same thing Tales games always have, a very interesting story with familiar feeling controls and gameplay that are easy to pick up by newcomers. Yes, there might be extra widgets that haven't been seen in other Tales games before, like the fusion or equipment levelling, but the very core is very much the same basic game that Zillia or Graces or Symphonia or any number of the series. It's a brand shiny new game that feels like a new chapter to an old and much loved book. And sometimes that's really all you need to be an amazing game. Tales of Zysteria is out on the 16th of October on Steam and PlayStation, and I honestly think that if you're an anime or just a JRPG fan that you're going to love it. 
a worthy if not essential addition to your game collection. Thank you all for watching.